It's finally time. We are talking the 2023 rookie draft class. This is what we've been working and scouring and, and watching film over for so long, and we are excited to talk about them. We're looking at the quarterbacks and the running backs, and we're not just going to tell you if they're good prospects, but whether they're good for fantasy football, because that's what our show is. Make sure you like, subscribe, and enjoy. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Oh, welcome in. Tuesday, April 4th. The Fantasy Footballers Podcast, Jason Moore, Mike Wright, Andy Holloway, some other guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But hey, we did it, everyone. We made it through the weekend. We bypassed. Look, April Fool's falling on a Saturday was, it was incredible. I thought of you often Thank when you. I saw Thank you. some of the... Uh, Ill -fated, hilarious ill-fated attempts hilarious my, pranks my son did attempt to get me my 11 year old yes because look and he children love april fools they love it what he did was he tied a piece of string to his um shower curtain and it was tied to like a big grasshopper bug and his Real bug, fake. a fake bug. Oh, okay, okay. Good, Not good. a. He didn't really tie it. <laughs> it's like impressive he caught work. a bug. No, you try to tie a rope on a grasshopper, <laughs> and he tried you to. Can't wrangle him. He tried to get me when I was groggy, like I was in bed. Uh -huh. I was getting up on Saturday morning, and he goes, and he's like, he, he did a pretty good acting job. He's like, there is something in my shower. I keep hearing a sound in my shower. And so I'm like kind of going groggily over ah, there. He gets me the shut uh, up, kid. gets me the fly swatter. He's like, please, please. Get it for me. And I go in there, and I knew that I, I figured it out when he said, now open it real quick and then get, <laughs> and get the bug. <laughs> and I go, I go, why would I? I literally, I go, why would I open it quick? It's going to scare the bug, and I can't hit the bug. And he goes, no, Dad, no, real quick, real quick. Uh, yeah. And I go, something, you're trying to get me. Something fishy here. So, yeah. Come on, kids. We got to do better than that. <laughs> Open it real quick, like <laughs> he's got it while his phone is pointed at you. Yeah, I was, it was good. And then he tried to get his mom, and it didn't work either. And, uh, and I think it, you know, good attempt. But eleven but, years old is the peak age for for April Fools. I think it really should be. That's when everyone should leave it behind. <laughs> but it was it was great because it was Saturday, and I just, I feel like it didn't have the same uh, impact that it normally does. No, nobody got you, Mike. No, well. I got got by uh, Little Caesars because they put theirs out two weeks before April Fools actually took place. What was the stuff? hilarious prank that it oh. would be corn on the cob would be a crust? But this is part of the principle of what you don't like is that you should have to do it on the day. Like yeah, you, you shouldn't get a two week. Buffer yeah, respect either. to the day. Great day. Yeah. Did you did you get? Uh, there gotten? were uh, no. This, I I agree with Mike. Not at all on. April Fool's. April Fool's is awesome, but that it falling on a weekend made it the quietest April Fool's that I can remember. No personal pranks around me. The social media not quite as big. I think the most important thing, though, about it turning over to April is what it means is about to be. It's gonna, it's gonna be May. It's, it's so stupid. What? <laughs> It's that, so ridiculous. It's way too early. What did we? What did we just do? I don't know what you, you're ruining it. No. You just it's jumped the shark about, with the joke. It's no. not about to be May. It's oh, yeah. April third. <laughs> it's it's gonna be May next. You are. You're welcome. Um, you're welcome, America. Uh, the April what Fool's just joke happened? Is I have to do a show with this guy. I love that it's gonna be May, and you're just you're ruining I know, it. I know. I'm getting it in early. I'm gonna get it in often. <laughs> Brace yourself. <laughs> so stupid. <laughs> All right, welcome in. Oh. We've got a great show for you today. We're covering the quarterback and running back rookies. A preview show right here, right now. Very excited. And uh, NFL news to talk about. Today, I mean, dynasty season is oh. upon us. You know, people are drafting. The rookies 
everybody's uh, in the midst of the, the scouting process, which is tiered, right? You have, you know, pre and post combine or dynasty pass over at ultimate draftkit.com. It's available. You want to start deep dive in dynasty. What I, what I've kind of figured out here is we have set up a series of levels that you can pursue in your dynasty knowledge. If you play in a dynasty league, if you want to research these rookies, We've got the overview shows this week right here on the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. If you want to dig even deeper, you heard us talk about it the last couple of weeks, but the Dynasty show, the Fantasy Footballers Dynasty-specific podcast is making its debut tomorrow. Oh, yes. And so you can go and yes. follow the show on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, wherever you listen to podcasts. The debut show tomorrow it's going to be a mix of Kyle the Borgogan, Matthew Betts, Mike Wright, Jason Moore talking deep dives on these dynasty rookies over the next, what, four episodes. And as we head into the NFL draft. So it's going to be huge. You're going to love it. If you're a dynasty player, we did it. Get ready for hot takes. Spicy. Hot and spicy. Yes. Takes. Even though Mike... You can't quite handle the spice like you used to. There will yes, be some that's true. spice. I've had, to, I've had to cut back on my hot spicy takes. So very, very excited about that. Tomorrow we'll be into quarterbacks, running backs today, looking them over. And like I said, the Dynasty Pass right now, all that content is on the website at ultimatedraftkit.com. Here is today's quick question. What player is most likely to lose fantasy value after the NFL draft? I'll, I'll hop in with one that um, saddens me a little bit, especially considering um, my current draft rate of this player in underdog uh, best ball drafts. But I think Ryan Tannehill is going to have another quarterback drafted to his team. Uh, you've seen them recently taking uh, prospect trips. You know they they just had Hinden Hooker out uh, for a visit, and they're they're doing their due diligence. It does not seem he is uh, going to be the quarterback of the future there. And right now he Tannehill. is, yes, Ryan Tannehill. And so um, right now he's the, the quarterback going into week one after the draft. Yeah, he might not be. He might be someone that you pretty much can't draft. And they, they were linked with a potential trade up with the Arizona Cardinals at number three as well, which several teams have been uh, linked with that Cardinals pick. It seems to be the one that was – that is most likely to move for a quarterback. They're drafting ahead of the Colts at number three. Colts in the market, several teams in the market. It'll be interesting. Um, lots of rumors about maybe, you know, situations like Tanda Hills or like Jimmy G in, in Las Vegas where the next man up could be taken in this draft. Mike, what is the name that uh, you'd like to bring to the forefront most likely – to lose fantasy value after the NFL draft. Sure. So in the NFL draft, it feels like a running back is the easiest position to to take a hit because uh, teams frequently draft a round three running back. You're like, why? Why? Why did you just do that? You guys, you have good running backs on your team. They don't care. They just the NFL teams do this all the time. And the Los Angeles Rams are a team that they love just surprising people and drafting running backs when it feels like they don't need to. And I think that Cam Akers is going to have the replacement drafted this year. It's been quite a – just a career for Cam Akers of, you know, with the really unfortunate Achilles injury. Looked really bad to start this year. We had the rumors flying – which weren't even rumors because it, like, it was actually Coach McVay essentially saying that, yeah, Cam Akers isn't going to be on this team anymore. Then nobody wanted to trade for him, and Cam Akers remained on the team. And then he played more, and then he was awesome yeah, for the so team. So weird. Like he had like these huge fantasy football outings. He had huge NFL outings. It was so bizarre. But it feels like the replacement for Cam Akers will be coming in the draft this year from the Rams. The Rams were at the point in the season where it was just we're we're done. We don't care. Matthew Stafford is gone. Um, the season is gone. So I could see that. I mean, I wouldn't call week 13 on prescriptive for Cam Akers' future. And and the Rams have, uh, unlike usual, usually the Rams have no draft picks. They actually have a lot of capital. So it, it makes sense for them to go out and get a replacement. 
I'm going to go with Samaj P. Ryan, running uh, back for the Denver Broncos. Ooh. Signed a two-year, $7 million deal, $7.5 million, $3 million guaranteed. We've seen the reports of Javante Williams' recovery and how long it's going to take. This is a an offense that cannot, I'm sorry, depend entirely on Samaj P. Ryan. Maybe it won't Says be you. Maybe it won't be the NFL draft that buries P. Ryan, but they do have two third round picks. I would not be shocked for them to be in that uh, that area right there, back to back in the third round, that they could take one. If it's not the draft, I think P. Ryan has a bigger named competition back there. And uh he's twenty seven and a half years old. I think he's a reliable runner, but we we know what Sean Payton wants to do on the ground. And I think he needs more than what he has right now. So, uh, that is my answer to the quick question. Let's hop into the news. News and notes from around the league. Well, Marvin's going home. Marvin Jones, one year deal with the Detroit lions, $5 million. All right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Little baby boy, old 33 year old man going back home. Tim Patrick cleared to do everything. <laughs> I mean, he can do what anything is, he wants. What is that quote? Even? After su- that was a quote. Yeah. I know. Um, after suffering a torn ACL, he can, you know, he can build a garage from the <laughs> ground up. Yeah. yeah, he can do whatever he wants. Do, permits? I don't need them. Cleared. Cl- yeah, can climb a tree. Does that mean he's allowed to murder? I've Ooh, cleared to like do li- everything. License to kill. He's finally above the law. <laughs> He lives within the purge. It's, uh, it's all right. My doctor said I'm cleared to do anything. <laughs> yeah, I can do whatever I want. Uh, fire- Here's my doctor's note. <laughs> my name's Fireball. <laughs> you handed the note? Yeah. I'm cleared to do Do you anything. know you were driving 120 and a 35? Uh, <laughs> officer, look at this. I've been cleared. Uh, he is 29 years old, under contract for two more years. He's in. We, uh, we just brought him up. I think last week of potential sleeper. One of the sneakiest picks right now. Yes. Because this is still a team that despite the comments made by Sean Payton, I still think they move one of those wide receivers. So It could be on draft day. Exactly. Yeah, and then and all of a sudden you're looking at Tim Patrick being drafted wide receiver 76 in best ball, and he's he's a starter. I mean, he's like a primary uh, top two target in the offense. Those are the, the, the things that – I really like to look at because so much of fantasy football is not necessarily it's this guy or this guy. It's at the beginning. It's analyzing what is the market doing wrong. And with, with fireball Jones, AKA Tim Patrick, AKA cleared to do everything being drafted at wide receiver 76. That is the market saying there is a 0.5% chance that Tim Patrick is the wide receiver two. On this team, because meanwhile, Cortland Sutton and Jerry Judy, do you have those the ADPs? I can look them up. Yeah, so look those up. Of like, when you have a discrepancy that is that large, of saying, "Well, this is impossible," it's dumb. Of course, it's possible. He's a good player on a on a good sizable contract, and this is yeah. So Jerry Judy at wide receiver twenty two. Sure, he's probably the probability is Jerry Judy is the go to wide receiver for this team. Cortland Sutton's at wide receiver forty five. But if Patrick replaces Cortland Sutton's production, that would not be surprising in the least. Meanwhile, the market is saying that that's not possible. And then uh, I've seen this report, Dalvin Cook making excellent progress in his recovery. Uh, I saw Rap Sheet retweet this report from Tom Pelissero and talk about the fact that, you know, he had offseason shoulder surgery. The quote from Rap Sheet was that his dislocations are now going to be a thing of the past. He would never get hurt again. Please come trade for him. He has three years left under contract, dead cap hit of only $3 million. We just don't know where this Dalvin – like there's a handful of these running backs right now that are huge names that have been big names in fantasy for a long time that we actually don't know where they're playing football. And leading that list, Joe Mixon, the comments about Joe Mixon being on the oh, Bengals man. were as, you know, indifferent uh, as could be. I mean, they're vi- I think it was their – VP. Yeah, I think it was their executive vice president of football operations when she was asked about, um, you know, do you are are the plans to have Joe Mixon on the roster? There was about a three second pause. <laughs> it's then rough. A, um, he's on the team. He's on the team, and he's a good player. It was brutal. If you if you just read the quote, it sounds okay. 
If you listen to the answer, you go, well, so he's not part of their <laughs> plays. I mean, they're waiting for his own off-the-field issues. See, that's what I – Right, they don't know the answer, and so to to you know, in all fairness to her, she doesn't know what's going to happen with his current off the field situation, and there's a lot of different directions it could go. Joe Mixon could absolutely be back with the Bengals week one. I I think that the way that we don't know is the same way that those inside the Bengals organization they don't exactly know what is going to happen with Joe Mixon. Yeah, she definitely answered in a way that protected her from. Uh, any claims that she was endorsing him and any off the field situations. Dalvin cook is another one could be back with Minnesota. He's, he was a very good runner last year for them, had some of the biggest runs in football, but you know, they have the opportunity to let him go. And then, you know, other running backs that are out there, Ezekiel Elliott and the rumors that we talked about last week, these are players that have made contributions in fantasy for a long period of time. No home, for sure just yet and all of them could be draft day victims as well yeah you know you talk about the names we mentioned earlier specifically Mixon and cook you might find out exactly what's happening on draft day if you don't know before then uh any other news that we need to talk about nothing hey rookie welcome to the nfl all right we are into the 2023 rookies, the overviews, quarterback and running back position today. The draft is on its way, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, yeah, it's near the end of April. Like, generally the good time to But be what hitting. happens after that? That's when you use the it's butt. Okay. See, there we go. See, that's how yeah. you do it. It's gonna be May. If that had been the first entry of the draft, yeah. that would have been well said. I just, I had to show... My my colleague here. That's how, it's how you done. do it. Okay, and thank remember, you. I will. You I'll, it, I'll take notes and I will apply those notes. Try often. Try next episode to find a spot and get it in there. Okay. But uh, we're gonna go through the scouting process. Talk through these quarterback uh, relevant the relevant quarterbacks for this upcoming draft. Our fantasy thoughts on their potential destinations. What we found on film. Like I said, the Dynasty podcast tomorrow. The Dynasty pass at ultimatedraftkit.com. And then there's there's been a ton of rookie profile articles hitting the website as well. You can get rookied out if you want, is yeah. what I'm saying. Like, uh, if, yep. you, if you just want to live there, like, I don't know if there's a time I've walked into our three-person uh, office where the three of us work and have not seen film up on Jason's screen. Uh, and I'm not talking, like, Avengers. I'm, I mean, like, <laughs> game film. But he, uh, it, it is on 8 millimeter though. Right. Right. right, right, right. Yes, he I, I need the sound the behind me <laughs> to feel like it, it's really working. <laughs> so let's start uh, with the quarterback position, and uh, let's start with C.J. Stroud. Yep. Because he is currently our number one quarterback on the rookie ranks. Was not the case throughout the entire offseason here, but I think it has been the case ever since Carolina moved into the number one position. Is that fair? Uh yeah, I mean I before I obviously CJ Stroud has gotten a bump up in the entire NFL draft community since that Carolina Panthers move because the betting markets and people close to the situation believe that CJ Stroud is most likely to be taken number 1. But right now we're just talking about these prospects as talents. Mm -hmm. Before we know where their landing spots are, um Mike, I know you have CJ Stroud as your number 1 and then a gap. Yeah, I like I, a lot of people have Stroud, Bryce Young, you know, pretty similar. If they with if Young goes one, whatever. For me, where I have my tiers of of these rookie quarterbacks, it is it's C.J. Stroud in his own tier of I he to me is the can't miss quarterback of this year. So talk to me about what gives him that separation in your mind between him and, and Bryce Young. I I watched the Georgia game. Uh, that game as a isolation event like C.J. Stroud is the future of the position. I mean, he was so amazing in that ball game and yet wasn't the unanimous number one pick going into the offseason, sure. even if he's the betting favorite now due to the trade. What separates him in your mind? Is it is it simply the fact that he is his size compared to Bryce Young? Or does it go well beyond that? It goes beyond that 
for me. Of the size is is certainly a check mark in Stroud's favor. Of you know six three, about two hundred fifteen pounds. While Bryce Young is he's small. He's he's like Kyler Murray size, which a lot of NFL teams they're just they don't want a quarterback to be that size. You you want a guy who, who's tall can see over the line. But when I'm watching Stroud, and yes, it, it's it's hard to not start a conversation talking about a quarterback without talking about the wide receivers on his team. And the wide receivers that he has played with are just absolutely ridiculous. You have Garrett Wilson and Chris Olave, first-round picks, who already look like they're going to be stars in the NFL. Now this year, you, coming into the draft, you have Jackson Smith and Jigba, who had his big year with Stroud. He looks like he's going to be a first-round pick. You have Marvin Harrison Jr., who's going to be a first-round pick next year. So, yes, he is playing with way better wide receivers than any of these quarterbacks. Maybe any college quarterback that we've seen other than you know Burrow because he had his two guys. But the plethora that Stroud has had has been ridiculous. But watching him just – he's he is super accurate, and it's the decision-making of making really smart – and rapid decisions, not you know going through the reads and always ending up seemingly on the right spot. You had his his breakout campaign, forty four hundred yards, forty four touchdowns, but a seventy two percent completion rate. Just that's absolutely sensational. That dropped down to sixty six percent. The numbers weren't as Madden like this year, but when I'm watching him, like he is, he's so poised, so confident, and accuracy is. To me, you know, like we all scout, we all have like our, our top thing that we're looking for when we're scouting, and I'm more of the side of give me a quarterback who is accurate right now. Don't give me someone who the the smart gurus in the NFL like, oh, I can definitely fix this player because the the rate on quarterbacks' accuracy getting fixed compared to guys who already have it is clearly on the side side of players who are already accurate quarterbacks. So that's why. Stroud is up there for me. Yeah, if, you, if you're looking for a pocket passer who is accurate, who makes NFL caliber throws, yeah. has great arm strength. This isn't, you know, the the rocket arm of Josh Allen, but he is not um, he's not a inferior arm strength player. He makes some great throws to the outside, puts it exactly where it should be. I also think he is really, really good as far as passing on the run. Um, sure. He has the physical ability to be a more mobile quarterback, which you love for fantasy football, but that has not been something that has been an active part of his game. Uh, uh, you know, if you if you're looking at his entire game log, there's some games where you see him get out and he's got wheels. He can do it. So I, I, I think he is probably the safest of all the prospects because you don't have to worry about his size with Bryce Young. You know he's going to have the draft capital to have guaranteed years. He's very, very accurate, can make every throw. So when you're looking at safety, C.J. Stroud is the safest. He is not my number one, and I know he's not your number one, Andy. So really, I made that switch today. Um Ooh. And uh, so uh, the next switch? player we're going to talk about is actually our, now our consensus number one quarterback. I guess we'll find out who that is in a minute. All right. We're talking about Anthony Richardson. You moved him Wait, up. not Bryce Young? You moved Richardson up I to moved one. I moved Richardson up to one. Now, okay. to be clear, just – you know, we're not sitting here from an NFL draft analyst yeah, perspective. Yeah, we're talking fantasy. We're talking about rankings as they pertain to fantasy production for the future, which is why Richardson is, a, a, you know, he's at number one for me, is because of his elite athleticism and what that represents as a cheat code in fantasy football. Uh, I'm going to hand the baton to Jason because I think he, you know, his doctor told him he needs to talk about Anthony Richardson for at least 30 minutes a day. Uh, for his own mental health, but t talk to me why. Talk to me about why you put him at the very top. Yeah, and, and and how guaranteed is he as a prospect? Yeah, so for fantasy purposes, if I'm a if I'm a GM in the NFL, absolutely, I'm taking C.J. Stroud number one. There's no chance I would take Anthony Richardson over him. He's a very raw prospect. But for fantasy football, you just look at who you draft. Right, you're going to draft Patrick Mahomes because he's maybe the greatest. NFL quarterback of all times. And outside of that, you're wanting these mobile guys. You're wanting the Lamar Jacksons and the Jalen Hurts and the Josh Allens and people who can actually be a dual threat option, Justin Fields. And there is really, I mean, none of those guys are as athletic as Anthony Richardson. He has a rocket 
cannon arm. He does. That can throw the ball 75 yards. He has the body of Cam Newton. He is faster than Cam Newton and bigger. He can be a true weapon. And so a couple months ago, it looked like, well, where's Anthony Richardson going to go? Is he going to be a first-round pick? Is he going to have to sit for a year or two behind players? Now, I haven't seen a mock draft where he falls out of the top five. And I think it's a virtual lock that he's drafted in the top ten in the NFL draft. If that happens, we have a guarantee of fantasy production. I'm not saying he's the best quarterback out here. He has uh, Mike. Mike is pretty down on Anthony Richardson, and I don't blame him because we were watching film together, and Anthony Richardson made this just incredible throw. Just yes. absolute. Like no, most players can't make this throw. Put it on the money deep down the field, and then Mike goes, "Okay." So now you know the next two passes are going to be bad. <laughs> and then we're watching because because you know it's like good, bad, bad is at at the best, and then the next two throws were absolutely horrific so bad but for fantasy football it really doesn't matter he's gonna score touchdowns he's going to uh, he doesn't actually turn the ball over that much he's gonna run a ton he's gonna rush touchdowns in from the goal line here here's what i'll say though about a red flag because we haven't ranked at one because we know the production when he starts will be guaranteed but if you're looking at a long-term dynasty perspective and you don't believe in the talent long term of Anthony Richardson as a thrower, which will be required to be on the football field mm -hmm. for a long period of time. I mean, he threw, he had 17 touchdowns on 54% passing last year. You're talking about the two guys he's competing with in the top five in the draft, Stroud and Bryce Young, who are 40, you know, Bryce Young was a 47 touchdown, 4,800 yard Heisman winner throwing the football. Is it, is it potentially short-sighted because he could be a, Mariota like career arc where you're drafted with the draft capital. I'm not talking about it as an athlete. I'm talking about as a, we've had a lot of top 10 players that they get a couple of years, they get a shot. They're not the quarterback teams want. They turn into backups. You know, it does that world, you know, you talk about Stroud being safer. Mm -hmm. That world exists for Richardson, right? If he is not a good enough passer at the NFL level, he will flame out of a starting job in a couple of years. I mean, it's just a matter of fantasy football strategy and preference, right? Risk I would tolerance. rather have I would rather have 3 years of absolute elite production that can get me a championship than 8 years of production that is far more guaranteed to be like a Kirk Cousins, right? I mean, Kirk Cousins is a great fantasy asset. If you draft a Kirk Cousins, it it's a win. But he's not really the guy taking you over the top to make a championship. If Lamar Jackson ends up for some reason, flaming out at this point forward, and you look back in time and go, man, Lamar really only had like two great years. Well, you want to know what he did in those two years? He won people a lot of championships, and I would rather take that for the peak than just have like, well, I know I'm going to have a guy that's playing for a long time, but he doesn't push my fantasy roster over the top. That's kind of my strategy. Yeah, I mean, I think there are – I think we'd all admit there's more risks to Richardson – in that realm of just being unproven production wise as a passer. We're, we're going through it with Trey Lance right now where I know he's suffered under injuries, but it hasn't been entirely injuries. It's been practice performance one year at, uh, in college. So some risks exist there, Mike, do you want to weigh in on Richardson yeah. and what, where you have him? So it's Anthony Richardson is so hard because I feel like I'm betraying everything that I love and believe in for fantasy football of shooting for upside. I agree with Jason. If if he doesn't have a long term career, but he helps you get you know a, a chance at a, at a championship or two, that's that's a win right there. Even though you'd like him to have a longer career, but he has you know like how Trey Lance really really green. You know he started one year. The numbers are just. The, the quarterback part of the numbers are so dreadful of 2,500 passing yards, completed 54% of his passes. Like he has, he, he just percentage wise, he melts down in the fourth quarter. His percent, his completion percentage of fourth quarters of games is just, is absolutely atrocious. There's not really anywhere on the field that he is elite or, or it takes over the game. His rushing numbers, they're fine. You know, 100 attempts, 650 rushing yards in 12 games. Like when Cam Newton was the number one pick, he, but he, 
he absolutely dominated the, in that part of the game. Lamar Jackson, over 1,000 rushing yards when he was a college quarterback, so you still don't have that production. You can look at – maybe it's the school, maybe it's the offensive scheme that, that can be factored in as well. But I'm so concerned about him even being a, a starter for an entire season – that he is really, really risky. I'm not saying I, ask, I won't take a chance on him at, at certain points, but where the market is driving his draft capital, like you guys have him right now at number one, if you're playing in a super flex league, if he ends up going as the second quarterback off the board, that won't surprise me, but I wouldn't be willing to do let, it. Let me ask one follow-up to Jason here, because one one thing that exists with Richardson being a lower pick than likely Stroud or Young is that he could go to a place like Seattle – where he sits for the first year. That yes. would be way better. Which would be maybe better long term, but not not great for the pick. And then in terms of the fantasy pick. Right. Is there a is there a series of places he could go that would change where you're gonna post yes. draft rank him? For for sure. Um right now, the places that I think he would go most likely, um, you know, the the Colts Indy, yeah. the Colts are a big one. And do I think he starts week one? No. I think Gardner Minshew starts week one. Do I think he sits for the year? No, I think Anthony Richardson plays the majority of the year if that happens. But yeah, if, if he goes to a place like Seattle, better for his long-term value, but I, you have to admit you're taking a complete sacrifice to, to take the 102 or the 103 in a super flex or, or even a first-round pick in a single quarterback league on a player that you pretty much are sure he's not going to play that whole season or maybe two years. Yeah, I'm going to pump the brakes on that. I would move him down in my rankings. Bryce Young is uh, coming in at number three here. It feels disrespectful on a lot of levels. I mean, Mike talked about the breakout season for C.J. Stroud in 2021. Well, Bryce Young was better yeah. that year. He was the Heisman winner, 4,800 passing yards, 47 touchdowns, just seven interceptions. You know, Richardson last year threw nine interceptions with 17 touchdowns. Like Bryce Young put on a clinic. I don't know if part of it is are, – are we getting this uh, residual aftershock of negativity built around the Kyler Murray up-and-down career so far that is going to Bryce Young because of his size? Um, I, I feel like those guys are being associated with one another quite a bit. It's not like when Murray when Murray was getting drafted, his association was Russell Wilson, right? Right. And, um, and maybe Drew Brees. Bryce Young is getting more association with with the undersized challenges that Kyler has had, throwing it into defensive linemen's arms. Bryce Young is a has is a proven commodity at an SEC leader school, Alabama, for multiple years. Um, but as a fantasy prospect, I, he comes in number three. Yeah, and and I if I'm an NFL GM, I absolutely draft Bryce Young over Anthony Richardson as well. He is I, I don't worry about the size so much that I you know I the size issue is not the whole stupid thing. You can't see over his offensive right. line. Yes, he can. He's played football his entire life. He's been absolutely fantastic. That's the dumbest thing. Is he going to get some more balls tipped? Sure. Deal with it if he's a great passer. This is just from a fantasy football perspective. He does not have the body to run the ball. He's not going to. Be, he's going to be a one hundred percent pocket passer. He can get out and scramble a little bit, but you are not going to have the coaches wanting him to run at two hundred pounds. And then you have the durability worries because you've seen Kyler get injured every single year of his career, and and so there's there's fears there. But basically, when we look at drafting veterans and we're saying, okay, it's our it's our draft. Who do we want to take? Do we want to take Tom Brady? Do we want to take Joe Burrow? Do we want to take uh, Kirk Cousins and Derek Carr and all the guys that are pocket passers? We know that they have to throw 40 touchdowns or 35 plus touchdowns to really be special. And so the chance of him being a 40 touchdown yearly thrower is, I think, small let let me ask the question a different way we're going through these quarterbacks which one of those top three means most or means the most to the receivers that he's about to the you know the team that he's going to you know you laid out right now Stroud to Carolina Bryce to Houston and let's give Richardson to the Colts who provides the most year one potential value for their receiving room uh, yeah it, it oh, certainly wouldn't that. be Anthony Richardson oh no <laughs> I think it, I, I would still have it be C.J. Stroud. Do you think it would be Bryce Young? I, I have checked out of the conversation, and I'm just thinking about Michael Pittman, guys. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Michael Pittman guys, would, be, guys, would be not good for – Guys, 
if Michael Pittman has to put up with Anthony Richardson's accuracy. <laughs> oh, you're going to hate Anthony Richardson even more. I am so sad right now, <laughs> and it's just an idea that's been floated. I uh, I was going to say, I actually... We destroyed this city. I, <laughs> I know the quarterback's the hot thing right now. I lean right now of projecting the draft, which is a fool's errand, of the Cardinals won't be trading down, and the Anthony Richardson and Will Levis, the other kind of like this, the next tier of quarterbacks, I think they're going to fall a little bit further down than people are talking about right now. I don't want you to say that because I want the Cardinals. <laughs> oh, yeah, that to would get be, a lot it would of be delightful action. Look, Will Levis and Hinden Hooker are the last two names I want to to bring up. Yeah, briefly. Uh, I, I I'm assuming your yeah is not Will. It's not Levis Will related. Levis. No, it is so, not. I don't get it. You know that, that's what that's my, my analysis on watching him play football is. That's a first round pick, huh? Look, I okay. I unlike a Zach Wilson endorsement, I don't get it either. <laughs> And I think <laughs> okay, I hadn't I didn't know where you were on and him. the problem with Levis to me as a fantasy potential commodity is you know you see this okay he's going to talk to the Raiders. It's like there is a point in this draft where you're drafted as a backup, mm -hmm. and you're also unproven production wise. Um, yes, you've got the physical skills and ability. Yes, we've seen a lot of those guys over the last handful of years from. Ponder to Gabbert to, you know, there, there's a lot of manual and look, there's a lot of first round quarterbacks that if you're going in that middle range, if he's a 10th, 11th pick Rosen and you end up being the backup for the first year. And then I just don't know if I see a great path for Levis. Now he could surprise us if a team makes him the priority and he goes at four, right? Because the Cardinals trade down and then they trade down again, and somebody and the first four picks are quarterbacks. Okay, maybe that means something a, a lot more to his future. Yeah, I mean, I I see him as a Daniel Jones type of comp to me. Uh, same what I thought that he's a physical guy who has a lot of holes in his game, but he can run and have a little bit of mobility. He threw forty six touchdowns and twenty five interceptions. That is, you know, twelve fumbles. He didn't protect the ball, and when I watch him in the pocket, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I, it's, I've never seen someone with less pocket awareness. I mean, that guy just gets crushed. He has no idea someone is about to hit him every time he there, gets hit. There's a lot of talk about his senior season and how we should kind of throw that away because of the injuries that he suffered and struggled with. If you listen to Todd McShay and um, uh, Hare, give me the Kuiper. Thank you. Uh <laughs> When they were debating this, this was a hotly – I don't know if you saw that clip. But mm -hmm. They were going at it because – Who was on which side? <laughs> Kuiper is a very, very big Will Levis fan. Oh, no. And <laughs> and McShay isn't as much. And so yeah. the discussion is around the fact that what you saw in the potential in his first year at Kentucky in 2021 is the Will Levis that you're drafting, not the injured, fighting through injury, never quite right. Will Levis of last year. Yeah, I mean... He regressed a lot. You, you've, you've seen that happen, right? Uh, Justin Herbert was an example yes. of someone yeah, that Oregon. was incredible, was going to be the next great thing, goes back to school, has a worse season, drops in the draft, and then it turns out he's pretty good. Yeah. And, and so there are some people comping Will Levis that direction, and they say, well, look, you got to look back a couple years and look at the potential, what we thought he was going to be. He had a disappointing final season, but maybe that's not, you know, he lost some wide receivers as well. and New yeah, offensive he was coordinator. Injured, and there, there might be reasons for this. He certainly has tools to throw a great football. You watch him at the combine, and you're like, that's a nice throw. That, like, he can, he can, he can spin the ball. There are some upsides to him, and for fantasy purposes, he runs. But if I had to place my mortgage on will he work and be a franchise quarterback or will he be a bust, I'd put it on the bust side. Uh, Mike, Hinden Hooker, yeah. somebody you want to talk about. Yeah, I just – Tennessee. Yeah, so Tennessee quarterback uh, was on his way to potentially winning a Heisman. I think he ended up Kyle Fifth. Yeah, he was a front runner for a while. Yeah, because he he tore his ACL, unfortunately, 
And the conversation with Hendon Hooker starts with he's coming off an ACL injury, which is never great going into the NFL, and he's old. For, yeah. for an NFL prospect, he's 25 years old, which is like not old to be a human being, but to go into the NFL at that age. He's that's, not Al Borland old. Right. Yeah, exactly. Which Just is, put it, He's older than Justin Herbert, who's been in the league a while. And next year he will be older than Justin Herbert. But watching his tape of the last two years at Tennessee, to me he is so incredibly – impressive of just delivering strike after strike you know uh you had uh, in 2021 68 percent of his passes next year was completing 70 percent of his passes uh and his touchdown ratio Jason, you were highlighting guys that don't turn the ball over how about 31 to 3 or 27 and 2 like the guy makes sharp throws he makes great decisions the fact that he's coming off an acl injury is a super bummer uh but I, I think that he is going to be set up. He might be, you know, like a back of the first or a second round pick where he's going to go into a situation like maybe Jalen Hurts, sit behind a quarterback for a year or two and get his shot. That's not necessarily great for fantasy football right now in your drafts. But I think long term, if Hendon Hooker does get his opportunity, I think that he's going to succeed. Yeah, the NFL draft's going to tell us a lot with him. I, I, I agree that he looks like a very good prospect. The problem is... And he, he does, for fantasy purposes, he does run more, like he runs a little bit, 430 yards, 620 yards the year before. The like, accuracy is so impressive. Yes. It, that part of it reminds me of like the way Bridgewater threw the football, you know, where Bridgewater doesn't give it away. And, and if you do land in a better situation because of the ACL... Yeah, it's just a matter of do you want to wait two years f to get your draft pick to play um, for, in your fantasy draft, and then when you have him play, he's going to be a 26-year-old, right. essentially rookie, so it it's That's tough. The, he'll he'll fall in drafts, but I just want to see where he lands first. And like to, to be that age, though, for a quarterback, he can play for another – 10 years like if if he gets healthy and gets right in his and it and the and the team likes him he could still have a a long career for dynasty all right uh like i said more deep dives in, on the dynasty show over the next uh month the rookies will be getting their their time in the sun yep. on the dynasty pod starting tomorrow running backs it's the Bichon minute. Yeah. Hmm. maybe even more than a minute it's, but really it's not really much to say <laughs> well, we'll talk. We'll talk about the uh, the running backs right now. A reminder from our Ten Things to Remember show: Rookies get run. They get opportunity year after year after year. Over the last decade, we've seen at least two top twenty-four rookie running backs every single year. Last year, Brees Hall, Kenneth Walker, Damian Pierce uh, fit the mold. The the year before was Najee and Javante, and uh, the year before that, five rookie running backs: Jonathan Taylor, James Robinson. Antonio Gibson, DeAndre Swift, Clyde Edwards, Alaire, all inside the top 24. So we're talking about players that are going to make a big impact in fantasy in year one. Philly, Miami, Buffalo, Cincinnati, the Chargers, Atlanta, among many teams that could use some help at the running back position, and there are some names out there. Have you tried the Bijan mustard? I have. It is delicious. It is. Now, did you try it on a hot dog? <laughs> I have tried it on a hot dog, okay. yes, and uh, and on a sandwich. I don't even remember how did a did a listener send it to us. Yes, yes. So Bijan has his own mustard. Thank you. You're thanking Bijan, or I'm, are you <laughs> both Bijan and the listener who sent in the uh, Bijanese? What is there to say about Bijan Robinson, the number one overall prospect in fantasy? Um, look, it, it is pretty simple. I think everyone out there by this point knows. Bijan's name they believe he is the number one uh you know offensive prospect in this draft class at the skill positions you know he's in everyone's top five big board rankings and the reason why is because he has literally every single thing that you look for in a prospect he just checks the boxes is he the best at those things, like, the, you know, he's not as explosive as Saquon was. He doesn't have the long speed that Brees Hall had. You know, the, he's not the best receiving prospect we've seen come out. But there isn't 
a hole in his game. He is big. He is strong. He is fast. He can catch. This he is can why block. I like your comp. My, yeah, my, this is why I genuinely I appreciate your comp because it, it and and I'm teasing it, but there's a humility within your comp. Yeah, I don't see Bijan Robinson as a number one running back for three years in a row. Yeah, Bar I, Barry Sanders, AP. Exactly. I don't. Uh, I don't see that. I see a Matt Forte. Yeah, a guy who can do everything, will be a workhorse back, and will be a fantastic fantasy asset. Being a top eight running Forte back for fantasy, great. Forte was fantastic, uh, and and that's kind of what I see as the 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 career projection for Bijan. Some running back twelve, three, three, nine. That was Matt Forte's four year span from twenty twelve to twenty sixteen. You're going to get a large chunk of time, which for a running back is three or four years, where he is. One of the best fantasy football assets at the position that will happen because he will come with enough draft capital to where his opportunity will be given to him. There are a, only a few destinations where cold water will be poured on that and you can't be sure of the opportunity. Is there Sadly, any place you can go where you will take another person number one in the fantasy rookie draft? No, I don't believe so. I don't believe that I... I uh, if he goes to How Seattle, about the question to you, Mike, is there any place that Bijan can go that he he will you'll be and any place that JSN could go where you'd be tempted to take him number one? Um, I don't think so. Is okay. it like I feel like the the places where you go ah is like Tennessee and Derrick Henry's still on the team of okay they're gonna use Derrick Henry this year, but then the following year I'm gonna have Bijan Robinson on a team taking the Derrick Henry role, which would be just insanely valuable. So there there might be a situation where you have to wait a little bit, but that's a wait that I'd be willing to put in. I will say this when it comes to his destinations, and obviously this will only be relevant for a couple of weeks. We'll know where he lands soon enough. But two of the highest odds uh, to land destinations are really bad for him, in my opinion, which would be the Washington Commanders and the New England Patriots. Those two places, I think he would be far less assured of a workhorse volume. I completely agree. Both of those both of those would yeah, be Patriots a problem. Would, would be a bad. problem. So would Washington because the, the They love their adora their adoration for mm -hmm. Brian Robinson is I think their adoration would go out the window if they spent a first round pick on Nope. No, Bijan. they no. no. I mean, no. you saw it back in the day. You saw it with Gibson too. With, you, you saw you saw it with Gibson. You saw it with Jonathan Stewart and D'Angelo Williams with this coaching staff. Like, yeah, maybe. you know, they they would split it. They don't look through the same lens we do. They don't, which at is all. dumb. Our lens is great. Yeah, fantasy for life. We should sell our lens on Shout Ballers. How does one sell that? Well, in Jason's case, it would be like a pair of glasses, except for we put. <laughs> Two Bijan stickers on the front of the lenses. <laughs> so, did you ever have those old uh, those old point and shoot cameras that would put the like Ninja Turtle? Yeah, I'm seeing Al nod. Put the Ninja Turtle. I've never so heard you, of this. It was like what? a 35 millimeter camera, right? And every and the film, I guess the film already had like Michelangelo's head on it. Yeah, different characters on different pictures. So you take the picture, but then like when you develop the pictures, they've already got like a Ninja Turtle in the corner of the picture. This was like high tech. Like a, almost like a watermark. My people, my people out there know what's going on. <laughs> yeah, almost like a watermark. Yeah, I'm upset. I didn't know about this. Oh, they were they were not great. I will never. <laughs> I will never. You've got. I got all these old pictures from my childhood that are, you know, they're corrupted by Michelangelo. <laughs> I'll never <laughs> cease to be amazed by how Andy, who is the youngest of us, is the oldest of us. Yeah, I just. Yeah, yeah. You remember all the old stuff. That's when I won my well, championship. Were, look, with every, Michelangelo. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. All the old stuff. I was. I was you know, experimenting with it while you were watching cable. I didn't, you guys were just watching ah, cable. Yeah. Gotcha. Four yeah. inches from the I was at screen. the I was at the library. Living the good life. Yeah. I didn't get any of that fun. All right, Jameer Gibbs. Let's talk about Jameer Gibbs, Alabama oh, man. junior. Um, I know Mike and I are enamored yeah. with what we've seen on film. Yeah, don't tell me the odds. Uh, he is 5'9", <laughs> 200 pounds, 4'36", speed. He wishes he was 200. Uh, <laughs> me too, actually. 199. Yeah, so the weight. Yeah. Is that an issue? That is an issue. That is a huge, huge issue. And that is his only one. That's it, which is not really a fair 
or fun thing to discuss because the dude is electric. 436 speed, and that was at the 40, but that just matched what you saw on film. Yep. There's some players where when you go to the combine, you just want to see what it is because you're like, that dude is so fast. I can't wait to see how fast he runs, and it just backed it up. He is electricity on the field, absolutely outstanding. <laughs> now, the problem is he is 199 pounds, which means nothing taken away from his talent or what he can do. But what it does concern me with is what opportunities is he going to receive to do said things on the field? He is probably not ever going to be a 300-touch player. Will he be a 250? 50 touch player will I he be a 200 touch player will he be a 150 touch player there I, are sorry go ahead really there are other great players who have had spurts of really cool fantasy output like my comp for, really cool <laughs> my, my comp for Jameer Gibbs it's not one that a lot of people like it's CJ Spiller who now in had a year he had a year he was a running back seven I've got three names yeah there's there's plenty that I think will prove a point you have to be super, super special to to excel and earn the opportunities. You have to be durable in your first year, I think. But like Jamal Charles, mm -hmm. under two hundred pounds, Alvin Kamara, and and I would say Kamara's a thicker. I know, boy, I know he's a thicker boy, but I'm saying from a style, like from a total touch standpoint, he didn't need as many touches to be effective. You have to be that good, is what I'm saying, to where you can be efficient on fewer touches, or like an Austin Eckler who. Look, it didn't seem like Austin Eckler's career path was to be the guy. It seemed like compliment. But then you're just so good that you do enough. And and I think that that stacks something against Gibbs that other backs that you guys like might not have to overcome. Yeah, Gibbs will have draft capital. He's an elite pass-catching running back. He averaged over six yards a carry playing for Alabama. Like, that's, that's the hope, right, for Jameer Gibbs is – he played at Alabama this last year. He dominated in the the, the most prestigious NCAA uh, conference for football. And he didn't have a problem being out there on the field and giving you tremendous production. He can score from anywhere on the field. Like, I mean, his long was a 76 yard touchdown, but he just, he can, it's like that Travis Etienne thing where he, maybe you bottle him up a few times. But here goes a 30-yard run, and especially mixing in the pass catching, I'm so excited to see what he could do. Again, don't tell me the odds because I know the odds are not in his favor, but so many of so many pieces of the argument are, and watching him play football, he is sensational. It, and, and I'm putting you on the spot here, so don't blame me if you don't have the answer. But is there a perfect home for Jameer Gibbs in this draft? Yeah. It, you got uh, one? Yeah, it would be the Chargers. It would be to replace Austin Eckler. Uh, they're not looking to give him an extension, even if they kept Which would go Eckler, with the being an electricity on the field would fit with a Charger. It sure would. Um, that would be a place where you know they're going to throw to the running back, and they're going to utilize Gibbs's best, most elite weapon that he has, which is his receiving game. He's on a high-powered offense. They've got a coaching staff who have been willing to really utilize a 200-pound running back. So that would be the destination that would say no fears whatsoever because the talent is it's there. unquestionable. It's there. Yeah. He is uh, he's just beautiful. He, he feels <laughs> – yeah, I, I, I can't say – the words that I call him in the that's, office. That's why, that, that's why I paused, Mike. That's why I paused and it's, then went dot, 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 it's, beautiful. Because it's, all I could ever think is what you call him in the office. It's, there's a uh, – I'll try and figure out how he, how do I say it. Uh, there's a song that has the same <laughs> title. Uh, but, yeah, so I'll share that somewhere else. Uh, but the, uh, the Cincinnati – He's a love robot. Yeah, there you go. There you go. I couldn't think of the singer. Who's – Ah, oh, gosh. Old crooner. I'll look that up. I'll look that up. Sorry, because I'm thinking Cincinnati Bengals would be – that would be a great place for him as well. It's uh, – Tom's James Brown? Yes. James uh, yes, Brown. yes. Once we get into this part of the show, we're you know, in the 55-minute mark or so, that's generally <laughs> when we pop open a bottle of Chardonnay. Oh, mm, man. Yes. And so – 
the, the, the last major running back we want to discuss is the senior from UCLA, Zach Charbonnet, who has the size and the skill. You two have been kind of, I don't know, competing for his attention yes. over the last month. The the thing about for Charbonnet is I fell in love with him two times Ooh. <laughs> because I scouted him last year. Look, we spent all of our time looking at pros. We're uh, you know, a year-round fantasy football show, and we focus on that. So our time when we're getting introduced to the rookies is really – you know, the, the playoffs for the NCAA and then starting to watch film from January up to the draft. I was watching his tape last year, and I'm like, who who is this guy? Because he is outstanding. And then he didn't declare for the draft. He went back to school, and I totally forgot about him. So and you had to put your love on hold. Yeah, well, it, no, I put it in a place where I didn't remember him because mm. I pulled up his film again. Or oh, this so time, you didn't even and make I the went, connection? Who is this guy? <laughs> yeah, I went full fifty first dates on him. Like I can attest to this. That like he has screenshots of me separately uh, <laughs> declaring how good this guy is, not remembering that I loved him the first time. <laughs> there, you had already yeah, fallen in yeah. love for fantasy All football purposes. If you want a ceiling, you know the honestly, you listen to other dynasty shows or or look at dynasty rankings, and Charbonnet is not the consensus running back three, which is silly. Because for fantasy purposes, you want a 215-pound back that can catch the ball. Yeah. Go look at just who the best fantasy assets are and then be like, what do they mostly all have in common? Oh, they're like 215 pounds or bigger, and they usually catch the ball. Those are the best ones. Well, guess what this guy is? He's six foot two, fifteen. He can catch the ball. He's fast enough as an athlete. He's so smooth with his pass catching, yes. too. I mean, for a for a big back, when the ball is thrown his way, it just sticks, and he is on the move. I absolutely – that there's he checks the boxes for me that I look at most. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm hot and bothered. For so, him. so is, let me ask it this way with Gibbs and Charbonnet, your post draft order is just going to be destination. It's just going to be opportunity and draft capital. Yeah. If, if, if there's a big gap between these are probably both day or second rounders. Maybe. So I see a world where Gibbs, Gibbs is, is first or second. second. Yeah. I, I, I think he'll be a second round pick. I, I think where yeah, did James Gibbs Cook is, go. James Cook was a second rounder. Okay. Yeah, Gibbs is probably a second round pick. I would not be shocked if he was drafted at the end of the first round. Charbonnet is a big question mark here. Yeah. He could fall post draft, which would I love vastly him. change the. Mike loves him. It would vastly change yeah. if he is a late third round pick. That will be much much more disappointing if he can go in the second round. Then I will have him over Gibbs. I, currently pre NFL draft, I have him as my running back too simply very similar to the Anthony Richardson thing. I look at what works for fantasy football, and I know that if he is drafted in the second round, he's going to have opportunity, and we see it all the time with running backs. Talent matters a, a good chunk, but opportunity is more valuable than talent. Is, if you're going to get the ball a ton, you're going to be good for fantasy. Is the worry with Charbonnet, because he's a well-rounded back. That's that's the attributes that, I mean, he, he can do it all. Um, maybe not a master of one. Is, is he somebody that might get passed over for some other running back that has a an elite narrow skill set in one area yeah I think that the team that drafts Charbonnet is going to be a team that wants a back that's going to be on the field every down and the majority of teams do not want that anymore the majority of teams want separate skilled guys and they want a rotation they want a running back by committee room to keep these guys fresh and healthy so I could absolutely see other backs going ahead Devon a chain is uh, he's basically Jameer Gibbs light he's a very electric Literally fast too. lighter yeah. version of him and so I could see a team saying hey for my NFL purposes that's better I don't you know he might only touch the ball eight to ten times but he has the chance on any one of those touches to make a house call Charbonnet is not going to be running 80 yard breakoff touchdown runs that's not happening so it really does matter his draft capital matters a ton to me I am just going to be on my hands and knees hoping and praying for that second round capital 
Are there other running backs that you want to mention towards the end of this show here? I know uh, is is running backs where you're starting on yes. the Dynasty Show tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow's episode is a deep dive. So there's a dot the dot dot here for sure. some of the deeper dives, but some other names that we need to be uh, aware of. You know, Mike and I, I believe both have um, Kendra Miller at four. Um, I don't know if I have four, but I have him up there. I think we we seem to like him far more than. Other like uh, our friends in the dynasty space enemies. Uh, well, you know, because yes. of now, the, of course, well, right. of they course, used to no. be friends. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's frenemies, frenemies. Yeah, yeah. Uh, cold blooded but, enemies. <laughs> but the the sentiment on Miller has been lower than what I'm perceiving in the way that I loved him. And the the name I would bring up is for more casual people to pay attention to is Sean Tucker out of Syracuse. He's another lighter. Guy, a lot of these guys. That's kind of the issue is just is the weight, but he is a burner. Uh, unfortunately, we did not get to see him run an official forty uh, at the combine or the pro day. But watching him on film, the guy is it to keep the theme going. Lightning on the field, and and he is also truly a a very very good pass catcher as well with great contact balance. Which contact balance is one of the traits that. I value almost over everything else. So he's a name, more casual dynasty players at this time. Make sure you, you're paying attention during the draft. There are 10 running backs sure. right now that I really like as far as their talent and their skill. There will not be 10 running backs I like after the NFL draft because there's not 10 good destinations that will have draft capital and all of that. But the order of these guys, I mean, there are so many different players. Whoever's drafted with good capital, I think this year you're going to have some wins. One of the later names I think will be drafted lower than most but I'm excited about is Israel Abanaconda that dude sure. is so fast don't he is 200 want... <laughs> Abanaconda don't want yeah. none if you ain't got food. I, I didn't know if you were busting it out or not. I, I mean I have to I can't say Abanaconda without you know yeah, your Abanaconda I mean... don't Abanaconda <laughs> don't want but none <laughs> Is this draft capital argument going to get submarined because of the diversity of, of talent? Because there's so many guys so that, like you said, there's not going to be a bunch of names that get the draft capital you like, but they might they might all, because of the amount of options, they could get kicked down a little yeah. bit further than you think so and still make contributions. It is a really ironic thing that the fact that the depth of this year's draft class at running back means that NFL general managers don't have to select one early. They can keep getting other positions of need and say, well, there's still eight guys I like. So then they all drop a little further. And at the end of the day, when that NFL team drafted him in the fourth or the fifth round, they mean less to them. I hate to say it. It's just going to end up being the truth. They are less committed to him. They cost less money. They are less vital to their future plans, even if they're talented. They but what they don't get the depth chart spot above the veteran that gets signed after the draft that has a bigger name. Exactly right. And they don't get it, they, they they don't so inherit. They don't inherit. <laughs> oh yeah, you got it. Um, we got it. Fantastic. We do some good work over here, fellas. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I really do. You need to have those that day two draft capital is is vitally important. But what it says to me is that maybe some of these running backs are going to be drafted later in your rookie drafts and they aren't going to be the starter. But when opportunities come with injuries to the presumed starters, we are going to be aware and have kind of a, a heads up on who's going to be able to step in to that new opportunity role and with actually a, crush with it. a bigger ceiling too. And uh, final question right here at the end of the running back overview for now, again, deep dive tomorrow on the dynasty podcast, search for fantasy footballers, dynasty, Spotify, Apple podcasts. You can listen in makes his debut tomorrow. It's got some mighty fine music to mm -hmm. open that show. Mighty man. Fine. Uh, I was all written by me and performed by me. Of course, as all Thank our music, for, as all our music is. Thank you for doing that. Um, give me a bust. Who's got the chance? Oh man, who's got the Devon A. <laughs> okay, I mean, like, and I say that mostly because of of how high I other people are on him, and I, I don't get it. Yeah, he's he's super fast. He's super duper fast, but he to me he, he plays. Like a guy who's five nine, one eighty five. 
I will go with the uh, very productive uh, Deuce Vaughn. Who is? Uh, we're we're picking on the small guys. We we're picking on small guys because while they're great football players, you can't be great for fantasy football if you don't touch the ball a ton. And when you're five foot five, a hundred and five pounds, or whatever he is, <laughs> seven years than that, but it's most likely that he does not receive the opportunity in the NFL to score a lot of fantasy football points. I don't necessarily trust my adoration for Zach Evans. And I think the draft capital mixed with uh, – I, I think he's the kind of guy I fall for sometimes in the, this college film season that doesn't always pan out. So I'm a little worried about him not having a future at the NFL level. But more about running backs on the Dynasty show. Brooks, what are we talking about on Thursday right here on the Fantasy Footballers? Rookie wideouts and tight ends. That sounds fun. JSN time. Oh, yeah. All right, that'll do it for today's show. Check out the Ultimate Draft Kit, ultimatedraftkit.com. The Dynasty Pass available now. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FFBallers.